afternoon and good evening from wherever you are watching. Welcome once again to my channel. My name is Delvin Wenani, a biology teacher and also an examiner. I will wish to take you through biology paper one from question number one to the last question. This is the biology paper one, KCC of the year 2022. So ladies and gentlemen, without wasting much time, I want us to go to class, but remember before you go to class, remember to subscribe, comment, share, so that we can reach as many people as possible. So let us go to the class. Now, welcome. This is how the paper looked like in the year 2022 biology paper one. I will take you from question number one to the last question. So question number one, state two reasons why humans are not commonly used as specimens for genetic studies. Uh, human beings, they are also just animals like any other animal, but why do we not use them as specimens in the lab? Uh, there are some of the reasons why, and I'm going to quote some of the reasons here. The reason number one why we may not use animals, that is human beings as uh, um, as specimens for genetic studies is number one human beings they take longer to mature to grow and therefore when you require them to observe maybe you want to require to, to observe a certain characteristics it may take long for you to be able to make some conclusion number two it is not convenient to uh, cage them to contain them and it actually is very difficult to contain a human being but number three, which is also very, very important, it is unethical. That's according to our culture. It's actually unethical for us to use a human being as a specimen. Uh, it's quite unethical and may not be accepted in the society. Now, question number two. On the diagram of the root tip below, I want to label the regions where, number one, cells become specialized, and we shall name that one as E. And then, uh, cells be increase in size as F. So let us see what we have. So this is a diagram that we have. This is a diagram that we have. And um, when we are looking at where the cells become specialized and cells where, where the cells increase in size. So we are going to name where the cells become specialized as letter E and then uh, where cells increase in size as F. So this is the final diagram. Um, this is where cells become specialized. This is where now the cells are actually increasing in size. This is where we have cell division at F here. Yeah, this is where we have cell division. Um, we remember if you give your answer outside the diagram, it shall be rejected. State two environmental conditions that can lead to formation of carboxyhemoglobin in the human body. We understand carboxyhemoglobin is a very, very dangerous compound. And I'm going to give you some of the um, conditions that can actually lead to formation of this carboxyhemoglobin in your blood. And when this one is formed, it can easily lead to uh, death. Number one is when you burn or burning of charcoal in a poorly ventilated room where we have inadequate supply of air and oxygen there will be formation of carbon 2 oxide. Now, carbon 2 oxide, commonly known as carbon monoxide, when it combines with hemoglobin, it forms this compound we are calling carboxyhemoglobin. And uh, the effect of that one I'm going to discuss later. Uh, it, this, uh, when there's also excess emission or supply of carbon 2 oxide, that is, it can also be coming from fumes uh, or, or from any other burning, uh, substance. We also accept if we have given correct examples, like from emission of mines. Mines, when there's mining, there's a lot of uh, production of carbon two oxide. Fumes from industries also they provide, they produce those uh, uh, carbon two oxide. Generators they produce carbon two oxide. Wildfires they produce carbon two oxide. But um, we also we also accept to uh, marking emissions of CO, CO that is the um, the scientific um, symbol for carbon two 
oxide. Question number B, that is 3B. Explain the effect of carboxyhemoglobin in the human. Now, we want to talk about the effect of that carboxyhemoglobin in the human blood. So I've talked about this compound, carboxyhemoglobin, as uh, one of the dangerous compounds in a human body. So, so what are some of the effects of this? Number one, uh, carboxyhemoglobin is a stable compound. I had explained earlier. And uh, once it is formed in your blood, remember carbo, carboxyhemoglobin, it comes in a, whereby the carbon 2 oxide combines with hemoglobin. So when it, when it combines with hemoglobin, it forms this carboxyhemoglobin, which is very stable. When you say stable, we mean it does not dissociate easily. So when it does not dissociate easily means that uh, your hemoglobin, that is the volume or the area. Carboxyhemoglobin is actually very stable and it's a stable compound. And it's formed when uh, that carbon 2 oxide combines with hemoglobin. And uh, remember I've said it does not dissociate easily and therefore it means if it is carried by the red blood cells, the hemoglobin, then it reduces chance of the same hemoglobin to transport oxygen. And to that effect, that means the individual will not be able to get enough oxygen in the blood. And therefore, it will result in suffocation or death. State the significance of each of the following characteristics. Number one, uh, being elastic. Now, this one is for accommodation of varied volume of air. This is, we're talking about actual characteristics of the lungs. They are being elastic. Why are they being elastic? Number one is accommodation of varied volume of air. We have having plural membrane. Having plural membrane. Why do we have plural membrane in our lungs? And this is actually, it acts as a shock absorber. It shields all the delicate lungs against what we call mechanical damage. It also reduces friction uh, with, with the ribs and adjacent bones. And that's why it, when you breathe, you can't feel the lungs moving because of the pleural fluid. The pleural fluid increases the friction and makes it easier for the lungs to move. Now below is a diagram of a bacterium. Uh, look at this diagram. This is a bacterium. Um, the first question it's identify the kingdom to which the organism belongs. Actually, we know um, this is a bacteria, and the bacteria belongs to kingdom Monera. They are Moneras. Um, state two features shown on the diagram that ca are characteristics of this kingdom. So remember, we are giving, we are very specific to give features that are shown on the diagram, not what we know, but what we can see from the diagram. What can we see? Number one, we can see there is no membrane-bound organelles, and it has very few organelles. We can also see no definite nucleus. And therefore, definitely they are prokaryotic. They are primitive. You can say they are primitive nucleus. You can say they, have, or they also have a circular DNA. Uh, we can also see presence of flagella. Actually, you can see presence of flagella, and um, it's also a unicellular. Unicellular, that means it's a single cell. But uh, it, we reject flagellum. Flagellum is actually um, the singular of flagella. And we can see there are four of them. So it is not flagellum. It is flagella because there are four. So plural and um, singular. Very, very important at that case. Name the part of the ovule that forms each of the following structures after fertilization. Number one. The zygote. What does the zygote form immediately after fertilization? It forms uh, the egg cell. Then we have the tester, which forms the integument. The, the tester forms the integument. This one happens after fertilization. Name the hormone responsible for the development of deep voice in humans. Name the hormone responsible for formation of deep voice in humans. Uh, the, the hormone is testosterone hormone. Now, you can see we are saying, the question is saying, name the hormone responsible for development of deep voice in humans. So it can, it can confuse in a way. Somebody can get confused and think maybe the question was ambiguous, but the question was not ambiguous. Actually, testosterone hormone is produced in both female and male. 
but it is producing high amount in male. And that's why we are talking about testosterone in humans. And that's why you can see some women having also a deep voice, but they have a fewer testosterone compared to their counter male. That's why we are talking about humans. Differentiate between a population and a community as used in ecology. So a population is a group of organisms of the same species living together in a particular habitat, while a community is a group of plants and animals, that's organism actually, or species with different organisms living together in a given habitat. We can even talk about um, a community as a group of um, organisms from different species, but living together or occupying a given habitat at a given time. So they are of different species, but the population is of the same species. We're talking about a single species of the same species living in a given or a particular habitat. 7b, explain one negative effect of the use of herbicides on human health. We understand herbicides are very good, we use them, but they also have some effects to our human. And one of these common effects, um, the, most of these herbicides, through a length time, they find themselves in our food chains. Maybe the herbicides will be fed, but you are, you are spraying your herbicide, and uh, an organism like now a cow may feed on it. After feeding on it, you go and feed on the same organism uh, in form of meat. So through that chain, you find that uh, most of these herbicides, they find themselves in a food chain. And therefore, which when fed on by human beings, they slowly accumulate in human tissue. And therefore, they cause diseases, they cause poisoning, affecting the body organs, systems are, some, 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 some of them are carcinogenic, and they may lead to death. Also, some herbicides, when maybe we are, we are applying the herbicides, when they are inhaled, they come into contact with the body and can cause diseases, they can also cause poisoning, affecting the body organ, system, and some of them are carcinogenic and also they lead to death. Number C, step two ways through which energy is lost from one trophic level to the next. As we move from the trophic level, that is from the producers down the trophic level, up to the decomposers up there, we discover that energy is lost. So we're asking, can we state any two ways in which this energy is lost? And uh, one of them is through elimination of waste, excretion, defecation, urination, and sweating. Number two is through decomposition of organic matter and consumed part, and also what we call partial predation. And also through respiration, through respiration. The following apparatus is used in biological studies. This is the apparatus, you can see it. Identify the apparatus. We're asking us to give the name of this apparatus and actually it's a pair of forceps. It's a pair of forceps. State its function. What is the function? This one is used for picking up or holding specimens in the lab. Number 9a, give two reasons why an aerobic respiration yields less energy than aerobic respiration. And the answer is, it's in the incomplete or partial breakdown, oxidation of substrates will actually lead to a very low yield of energy. Number 9b, explain why fats are not, so, are not efficient respiratory substrate. Explain why fats are not efficient respiratory substrate. Number one is because fats are insoluble in water and hence not easily transported the body tissues. And number two is also because fats require more oxygen to be oxidized. Now, the table below shows the concentration in parts per million of sodium and iodide ion in seawater and cell sap of a plant. So we can see this is seawater, sodium ions concentration in seawater. Iodide ions in seawater, sodium ions in seawater, so in cell sap, this is sodium ions in cell sap, so iodide ions in cell sap. So the first question they're asking, which of the two ions intake will be affected if the plant was sprayed 
with a chemical that inhibits respiration. Definitely, the, the one that will be affected is the one which depends on uh, active transport. And this one is what? This one is iodide ion. You can see it's going against the concentration gradient. So it's iodide ion that shall be affected. Explain your answer. The uptake of iodide ions is done by active transport. Now, it's an expression, which is a respiration or what you call energy dependent which when inhibited consequently will affect, impairs the active transport process, which is responsible for uptake of the ions. So without this active transport at being there, the iodide ion should not be transported because they are going against the concentration gradient. Therefore, they require energy. An experiment was set up as shown in a diagram below. At the end of the experiment, it was observed that the starch turned blue-black, while the color of iodine solution in the beaker did not change. Account for this observation. I take again. At the end of the experiment, it was observed that the starch turned blue-black, while the color of iodine solution in the beaker did not change. So account for this observation. This is a visking tubing. You can see it. We have iodine solution outside, then you have starch solution inside. But we are saying at the end, we discover that the starch turned blue black, the starch inside the whisking tube, while the color of iodine solution, this outside here, in the beaker did not change. So, why? And this is the answer. The whisking tubing is actually semi permeable, and therefore it allowed some. Uh, iodine molecules to move inside, which reacted with the starch to form a blue black color. Now, I want you to remember that starch molecules are bigger than the iodine molecules, and therefore they could not move out through the small pores in the visking tubing. The diagram below represents a stage in cell division that you can see this stage. Uh, we can see the chromosomes where they are aligning themselves. You can see very well. So next they're asking, name the stage of the cell illustrated. Which type of cell is this? This is metaphase 1. And we reject metaphase. We also reject metaphase 1 with this letter here. Metaphase 1 should be metaphase one. Give a reason for your answer and the reason is spindle fibers have formed a bivalent homologous chromosome and they have aligned at the equator. In the space below, illustrate the next stage of cell division after the one illustrated above. So this is after we see now the chroma, uh, the, the pairs of chromosome now moving um, to the pole, the side poles. You can see them moving. Number C, explain the disadvantages of inbreeding among living organisms. Number one is inbreeding that is hampers or it, it reduces variation resulting in the propagation of undesired genes, some of which might be weaker or lethal to the subsequent generation. And also there is what you call loss of hybrid vigor. But I reject low hybrid vigor. Reject low hybrid vigor. Explain why protozoans do not require an elaborate system of gaseous exchange. Now, they have a large surface area to volume ratio, and therefore, majority of its gaseous exchange is through diffusion, direct diffusion. So gases move in and out directly. And also most of these ones, they are found in aquatic areas. So we have what we call dissolved gases, the dissolved respiratory gases. So they simply move in by diffusion. That is oxygen moving in and carbon dioxide moving out by simple diffusion. The diagram of the field of, the diagram of the field of view of a light microscope was found to be 1.5 millimeter. Cell observed under the field of view appeared as shown below. Determine the length of each cell in micrometers. 
and we are told that one millimeter is equivalent to 1000 micrometers. Now this is how you compute to, to determine the length of each of the cell in micrometers. This is how you compute to get the length of each cell in micrometers. Name the cell organelle responsible for each of the following activities. Activity number one, protein synthesis, that is ribosomes. Uh, transport of lipids, that is Golgi bodies, you can say the Golgi apparatus. And also we have the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Number 15, name two organisms that belong to kingdom Protoctista. Name two organisms that belong to kingdom Protoctista. I'll name a number, but you only need to name two. So they include amoeba, amoeba or amoeba, paramecium or paramecia, euclina, plasmodia, diatoms, spirogyra, chlamydomonas, and trypanosoma, just to name but a few. Number 16, explain why only the fine adjustment norm should be used when focusing a specimen using the high power objective lens of the light microscope. Take it again, explain why only the fine adjustment norm should be used when focusing a specimen using the high power objective lens of the light microscope. And this is why, it's because uh, the distance that is space for manipulation on the stage is limited. We're talking about we are using the, um, we're talking about uh, high power objective lens. So manipulation distance is quite small. To avoid crushing the slide or specimen, question number B, an animal cell was viewed under a light microscope using objective lens of times 75 and eyepiece lens of times 10. Determine the total magnification of the image. So this is how we calculate. Total magnification is equals to eyepiece lens power multiplied by objective lens power. So that means we are taking 10, that is the eyepiece lens power, multiplied by 75, which is the objective lens power, and the result is times 750. Times 750. Number 17, a goat and a sheep are both herbivores. Explain why the two can comfortably exist in the same ecosystem. And these two, actually, they can exist very well. Why? Because a goat is a browser that mainly feeds on shrubs, trees, and leaves, while a sheep is a grazer, so mainly feeding on grass. So there is no competition for the food and also for the critical resources in the uh, habitat. The diagram below shows the bones of the human arm. This is the arm we're talking about. Uh, we can see there's a place labeled G and another one labeled H. Name the type of joint formed in the region labeled G. That's a hinge joint. This is a hinge joint. Then uh, at uh, H is a gliding. This is a gliding or sliding joint, but we reject gliding, gliding, but we accept gliding, gliding. Explain why the bones of the cranium are fused. Cranium, that is, we're talking about the bones of the head. Why are they fused? To form what we are calling a strong, firm joint, so as to protect the delicate brain, which is enclosed therein. 60 white and 60 black mice were released in an area inhabited by charcoals. After six weeks, it was established that 24 black and 8 white mice had remained. I take it again. 60 white and 60 black mice were released in an, eco in an area inhabited by charcoals. After six weeks, it was observed that, or it established that 24 black and 8 white mice had remained. Why? Account for the above observation. There was a greater decline in the number of white mice compared to the black ones. That one we can see from the observation here. The black ones did not decline fast, uh, much than the white one. 
white mice were selected against that by nature. They did not camouflage well with the surrounding because of their bright white color could easily be seen by the jackals, breditors, and like the black mice. Name the evolutionary theory that supports this observation. And this is Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection. Natural selection. Number 20, a small amount of substance K was applied on one side of a bean, coleoptile. After 36 hours, the coleoptile curved away from the side where the substance was applied. Suggest the likely identity of substance K. Definitely, this one must be what? An auxin, an intolacetic uh, hormone, or we also accept I. A, A, and this all this one should be in capital letters, I, double A. Explain how the substance may have caused the coleoptiles to curve. Now, the substance caused what we call a faster growth or an elongation, uh, a faster elongation of the cells on the side it was applied, which give rise to faster growth compared to the opposite side, resulting in a curvature, bending away from the side where it was applied I explain number 21 explain the role of antidiuretic hormone when the human blood water is below normal now we understand when blood water level is below normal the body is actually dehydrated and therefore more IDH is secreted the antidiuretic hormone stimulates the kidney tubules or what you call the distal convoluted tubule collecting duct increasing their permeability to water. So water is reabsorbed into bloodstream until the osmotic balance is attained. So the, the function of ADH is actually to increase the permeability of the kidney tubules. Um, equal amounts of crushed Irish potato were placed in equal volumes of hydrogen peroxide solution at various pH values. A gas L was produced. Its volume measured and recorded as shown below. This is now pH 4.2, volume of gas L produced was 2.9, pH 7, 5.9, then pH 9.2, 7.9. Identify gas L, that is oxygen, because I accept O2. Account for the difference in the volume of gas L produced at pH values 4.2 and, and 9.2. So more gas was produced at pH 9.2, and you can see here, uh, that's at higher pH. This is a basic or alkaline pH, which favored or gave what we call an optimum working environment for the enzyme catalase in the Irish potatoes. While at lower pH, that's acidic as 4.2, did not favor the optimum working of the enzyme, hence the low volume of gas L. Question number 23, name the causative agent of trichomoniasis. And this is trichomonas vaginalis. State the role of hair-like structures in each of the following. Number one, fallopian tube. They propel the ovum, the sperm, the zygote, and the blastocysts into the oviduct or the fallopian tube. The nozzle lining, uh, actually they are the trap dust or solid particles name the agent of pollination in a maize plant name the agent of pollination in a maize plant the agent is wind agent is wind the agent is wind below is a below Below is a graphical representation of a population of animal in a certain ecosystem over a period of time. We can see the time in years, population of animals this side, and then time in years this side. And we can see the curve, the way it is curving up and then goes like that. So let's go to the question. Determine the current capacity of the ecosystem. The current capacity is 75, that is plus or minus 1. 
So maybe you may ask, how did they get that one? Um, on this graph, you just look at the maximum that is 80 and the minimum it has gone is 70. That's where the variations are taking place, where there's a difference, the varying, uh, where they have the deflation. So you take 80 plus 70 divided by 2, that is 75. Then number B, account for the change in population for the first 15 years. What happened in the first 15 years? We can see there was a sharp growth in the population. And this population increase was gradual because the organism had adjusted to the environment. Conditions were favorable. Uh, actually, that there, there was reproduction and breeding. There was adequate food, water, space. There was no competition for resources. And there were no diseases. So more, more reproduced and there was fewer death. Question number 25. The diagram below shows a plant obtained from a certain habitat. Looking at this plant, this one is a plant that grows in an aquatic area. That's aquatic habitat. So the question suggests the likely habitat for the plant. This one is an aquatic from an aquatic environment, but we also accept correct examples. But we reject uh, marine, saline, and salty waters. Explain your answer in 25A above. Uh, it has brought a leaf surface to increase surface area for loss of excess water. Uh, the broader surface have more stomata on the upper surface to enhance loss of excess water. There's also presence of shallow roots to minimize absorption of water. There are flowers raised above water levels to enhance pollination. It has erangima tissues or large air spaces. And it also has broad leaves for buoyancy. So ladies and gentlemen, that one brings us to the end of our revision. I want to take the opportunity to appreciate you for following us, following me, following my channel. Remember to subscribe, remember to follow and share. Let's meet again in the next paper. Thank you very much and God bless you.